welcome those of you who are here in the council chamber and also all of those who are watching via webcast. It's my pleasure to introduce um, both Mark Schwerb and Rachel Ward. Mark is with uh, Region of Waterloo Public Health and he will pre be presenting first and then Rachel Ward who is with Bailey's Local Foods will talk. Mark? Thanks, Mary Beth. Um, afternoon, everybody, and welcome. Uh, as Mary Beth just mentioned, I work at uh, Region Waterloo Public Health, and I've been there for 11 years. And I've been lucky enough for most of that career to be able to work on food issues, which are something that I'm personally passionate about, and it happens to be an area where uh, my values align very closely with those of the region. So I'm, I'm very happy to be working on these issues and to be speaking with you today. So in the next 20 minutes, I want to cover why and how you can consider becoming a locavore. I'm going to talk to you about the benefits that having a local food system has for you and for the whole community. And then I'll focus on some of the things that you can do to eat more local food. Finding food still isn't that easy to do in this region or anywhere else in this province, but it's a lot easier now than when I first started working on these issues over a decade ago, uh, thanks to many of the things that I'm going to tell you about today. So first of all, is local food good for you? You don't need to be told that nothing beats the taste of a fresh local fruit or vegetable um, that you've planted and grown in your own garden. You know that what passes for tomatoes in uh, our supermarkets in the winter don't compare at all to those things that you grow yourself. But beyond the undeniably great taste of local food, is local food better for you? Well, the short answer is not necessarily. If you think about it, uh, you can see how it would be quite possible to eat a very unhealthy diet of salt-laden sausages and deep-fried potato chips, all of which could be grown or raised right here. Um, but we don't have a lot of evidence that local food is more nutritious. There's actually very few studies that have actually looked at this. Um, uh, there's one from the Journal of the American Dietetic Association from a couple of years ago that looked at all the literature on the subject in the previous 30 years and found only 16 studies that made any kind of uh, statement on the issue. Um, most of these were looking at farmers markets or people participated in, who participated in farmers markets or, and a few of them were about community gardens. Um, and in both cases they found that people who shopped at farmers markets or uh, grew food in community garden plots were more likely to have a, a healthier diet. Um, they, they also found a lot of positive effects um, for farmers markets and community gardens on community building and other social outcomes which are good for our, for our health for other reasons. Um, but there wasn't a really strong relation between um, you know, shopping at farmers markets and, and better diets necessarily. So it may just be that this is a subject that hasn't been studied enough um, but based on, no, uh, on what we know today I can't stand here and tell you as a public health representative that uh, local food is better for your diet. But what I can tell you is that Region Waterloo Public Health advocates for people to eat more local food because it's good for the health of the food system. See, in public health, we know that the health of the population is influenced by much more than individual behaviors. Population health is determined by economic, environmental, and social determinants of health more than any other individual behavior. And you'll see it on the three circles there how when you balance economic, environmental, and social factors is when you have a healthy population. So for example, a polluted environment obviously affects our community's health. People living on lower incomes or with fewer social connections are more likely to be less healthy than those with higher incomes and people with lots of friends. These are what we call determinants of health. So when we use this determinants of health approach to look at the food system, we see lots of problems. That's what we pointed out in our 2005 report, which you can see on the slide here. And if uh, you view this electronically, you can uh, click to the, the, full, the full report. Um, what we said in that report was that you know, we, we don't have a very healthy food system right now. 10% of us can't afford to buy enough nutritious food to, uh, to feed their families, and that's right here in Waterloo Region, while farmers can't even make a living um, growing the food for us. Uh, it, more than that, uh, those of us who can't afford enough to eat um, 
generally speaking, aren't eating a nutritious diet. Very few of us actually eat according to the Canada Food Guide. And we have a, rising, a, a concerning rise in diet-related chronic diseases as a result. And finally, the, the food system is far too dependent on fossil fuels uh, to be sustainable in the long term. So part of the way forward towards a healthier food system, and therefore better population health, is to relocalize our food systems. Buying local keeps more dollars in the, in the local economy, providing more employment, and giving, more, uh, and giving people more of a say in the economic decisions that affect their livelihood. Crucially, it gives economic support to local farmers who, as most people know and as public health's own research has shown, are struggling to maintain a livelihood from farm income alone. Plus, the act of connecting directly with producers of our food through farmers markets, CSAs, or direct farm buying gives us social connections known to benefit our health. For example, when public health evaluated uh, these neighborhood markets that we helped establish uh, throughout the region in 2007, we found volunteers with these markets describing their market as the neighborhood barbershop. Um, they spoke about markets uh, providing a sense of purpose for people, either in coming to shop and chat or in being involved in running them somehow. So creating this kind of public social space is good for population health. And I'm going to spend uh, a bit more time talking about how a localized food system can benefit the environment. So this is a report that I was privileged to work on in 2005 and which was published by Public Health. It's called Food Miles, the Environmental Implications of Food Imports to Waterloo Region. Food miles are the distance that food items travel from the location where they're grown or raised to where they're consumed. Our study looked at 58 foods which can be and indeed are grown or raised in Waterloo Region and we measured the travel distances of imports of those foods to Waterloo Region uh, and then made assumptions about which mode of transport they probably would have come in on, whether by truck or airplane or, or ship, uh, to calculate the greenhouse gas emissions associated with the transport of those foods. And what we found was that on average, imports of those 58 food items which can be and are grown in Waterloo Region uh, travel on average almost 4,500 kilometers to get here and that they emit more than their own weight in greenhouse gas emissions when you take into account uh, the emissions of those transportation uh, vehicles that they, they come in. And if you add up um, the consumption of all those imported foods uh, in Waterloo Region's population in one year, you get a total of over 51,000 tons of greenhouse gas emissions annually just from imports of foods that we can and do grow and raise here, which is equivalent to almost 17,000 cars on our roads. So our, our conclusion in the report isn't that we have to give up things that don't grow here like rice or bananas uh, or, or, or other foods that don't grow here, but we can make a, a significant difference uh, by doing simple things like eating more in season and preser preserving foods in, for the off season. So just as one of the examples from that report, and there's you know, 58 different foods examined in this kind of detail there, uh, canned tomatoes, um, which are obviously something that can be grown and, and canned here, travel over 5,000 kilometers on average to get to Waterloo Region, producing more than their own weight in greenhouse gas emissions. That's the 1.067 to 1 ratio up there. That's, that's the ratio of uh, greenhouse gas emissions to weight. Uh, and so you can see that uh, you can see some of the, the sources of our, our canned tomato imports and also how much fewer greenhouse gas emissions on the slide. Um, we would emit by growing and canning them here in Waterloo Region or even within a, a broader 250 kilometer radius. So I'm going to flash by this slide very quickly just to give you a sense of which food imports contribute the most greenhouse gas emissions in Waterloo Region. You can study this in detail on your own if you uh, care to pick up the report or, or view it online afterwards. So what we concluded when we looked at the data um, that we had found on the air emissions of, of food travel was that the relative impact of bringing foods from 250 kilometers away was not significantly different from um, the air emissions of food sourced from our own region. So if we wanted to take action th to replace some of our food imports with food from closer distances, we could take advantage of the food inf industry infrastructure that's already in place in southwestern Ontario and still make a significant impact on greenhouse gas emissions. So if you think about a 250 kilometer radius, that includes Toronto and, and beyond on the, to the east, and then south and west to as far as almost Windsor. So um, that's a significant food shed, and we can make significant differences just by eating from within that food shed. 
I feel obliged to talk a bit about what our food mile study does not say since its conclusions have been distorted by a lot of people, including critics and locavores alike. First of all, the, the almost 4,500 kilometer figure that I quoted a couple slides ago for average distance traveled by foods we studied only applies to imports of these selected foods as we had no access to data on food that travels across uh, regional or provincial boundaries because such a thing doesn't exist. So, so we, we, don't, uh, we don't take into account in our numbers PEI potatoes, for example, or Alberta beef. So we also pointed out in our report that our measure of food miles doesn't count the distances that we as consumers travel to, to, to purchase our food, um, which is often by car, from supermarkets. And this, according to recent British studies, is probably uh, very significant, um, and it's increased significantly over the last few decades of, as uh, food retailers have uh, consolidated and tended to move into bigger stores uh, at the edges of cities. Finally, our report was clear that to compare the total energy use of imported foods to local foods, one must take into account other factors in the food production process besides food transportation alone. For example, Ontario and, and this region grow a lot of tomatoes year-round, um, but in most parts of the year, that requires a lot of energy to heat and light uh, tomatoes in greenhouses. Um, you wouldn't have to do that in Florida. So it's quite possible that um, tomatoes grown in Florida in our off-season and trucked all the way here could have a lower greenhouse gas emissions um, amount than tomatoes grown here in the off-season. So it's something that we said right in our, point, our, our report. And this is actually the main criticism of the local food movement made by some self-proclaimed globovores, um, one of whom is Pierre Desrochers, who's a University of Toronto professor who wrote this book that I've got pictured there, The Locavore's Dilemma. It's subtitled In Praise of the 10,000-Mile Diet. So Desrochers um, praises the global food system as uh, one that legitimately it does provide cheap food to all of us, uh, and he argues that um, talking about food miles is misplaced emphasis because food transportation only makes up um, less than 10% of the total emissions from the food system. And uh, he's got a point. It's true, and we, we acknowledge that in our report. But to me, arguing that other aspects of the food system are bigger energy consumers than transportation is no reason not to focus on reducing unnecessary food transport. Yes, we can address and should uh, other sustainability aspects of other aspects of the food system, but as our food mile studies showed, uh, we can have a huge impact just from addressing this little piece of it. And yes, we should address the other ones too. So I'm going to finish this part of the, the why you should be a locavore part of my talk by mentioning the book that put the local food movement on to the uh, public stage a few years ago, uh, The 100 Mile Diet. The authors of this book um, embarked on a very ambitious project to eat only foods from within a 100 mile radius of their Vancouver apartment for a full year. Uh, they wrote a blog about it, which was really popular and got them a publishing contract and they published this book, which was uh, very popular and it was actually selected to be the book of the year by the One Book, One Community uh, group in Waterloo Region in 2008. If you haven't already read the book, I, I'd highly recommend it. It's not a polemic of facts and arguments, but rather a fun personal story of this couple um, and their struggles and internal arguments um, uh, while they try to walk their environmental talk. And uh, by the way, I can't mention this book without uh, mentioning that they interviewed me for the book and uh, mentioned our study on page 30. <laughs> so I, I think I'll, uh, I'll finish my argument for local food by actually reading a bit um, from the book. Um, in this excerpt, um, author James is uh, discussing with author Elisa whether they should give up sugar for their year of local eating. So this is James talking. The question of sugar was a reminder of why I wanted to try this local eating experiment in the first place. It isn't only that our food is traveling great distances to reach us. We too have moved a great distance from our food. This most intimate nourishment, the stuff of life, where does it come from? Who produces it? How do they treat their soil, crops, animals? How do their choices, my choices, affect my neighbors and the air, land, and water that surround us? If I knew where my food and drink came from, would I still want to eat it? If, my, if even my daily bread has become a mystery, might that total disconnection be somehow linked to the niggling sense that at any moment the apocalyptic frogs might start falling from the sky? 
we'll use honey, I said to Elisa. Yeah, she replied it doubtfully, honey. So what can we in Waterloo Region do to become locavores? We don't have to embark on an extreme local experiment like the authors of the 100 Mile Diet did. But starting to become more aware of our food decisions is an important first step. I'm going to try to describe some of the options we have for eating more local, um, starting with right in our own homes and, and sort of building out from there on a geographic scale. So first of all, options for being a locavore and eating the zero mile diet. The obvious ideal in, ter in terms of reducing food miles is to grow your own food. You don't have to have a big backyard to grow your own tomatoes, lettuce, herbs, and f other fruits and vegetables. Many front porches or balconies get enough sun to grow food quite well. If you have uh, more time and energy to grow food than land available, uh, you can obtain a plot in one of over 40 community gardens uh, throughout the region. I have some pictures and details of some community gardens uh, in the next few slides. And, and for new mothers, you can also look at breastfeeding as a way to reduce your food miles. In addition to all the health benefits of breastfeeding for both infant and mother, you can eliminate all the energy inputs, i.e. energy to manufacture and distribute infant formula, uh, required to grow food for your baby just by breastfeeding for as long as you can. Public health has helped coordinate a, a network of volunteers who operate over 1,300 plots in more than 40 community gardens across the region for several years now. And this is a screenshot of the uh, website of the Community Garden Council of Waterloo Region. And uh, if you watch this on your computer later when it's posted, um, this is a link to their website. And what that is is an, an interactive map where you can scroll to your neighborhood and click on any one of those balloons there to get the contact information for the, that community garden. Besides being a source of connecting city folk to the challenges of growing food, community gardens have been shown to provide a number of other health benefits. They increase neighborhood cohesiveness, encourage people to get exercise, and have even been shown to have a crime prevention effect. So here's a few sh photos from some of our gardens. Let's scroll through them quickly. Some of, uh, many of the, the gardens actually um, set aside a plot for uh, growing for donation to food banks, like this one here. Uh, this is one of my favorite examples. It's on the property of the uh, Region Waterloo Police in Cambridge. It's now used by Family Children's Services uh, staff, among many others, as a place for supervised family visitations. So an example of that social uh, dimension of community gardens. And here's one of our most active community garden volunteers, Greg Mikolenko, with some of his harvest. So thanks largely to efforts of local organizations in the past decade, it's become a lot easier for residents of Waterloo Region to find food from our own region. When Public Health surveyed over 1,000 residents in 2003, we found that 87% of respondents uh, felt it was either somewhat or very important to eat local food. Um, but we found that they s faced significant barriers to doing so. It wasn't readily available, and when it was, it wasn't necessarily very easy to identify which was local food and which wasn't. We we've come a long way since then. Our farmers markets in Kitchener, Cambridge, and St. Jacobs continue to be as popular as ever, and new ones have sprung up in Elmira, New Hamburg, Preston, the Beechwood neighborhood in Waterloo, and three community centers in Kitchener. The Buy Local Buy Fresh map, which I'll show you a bit more detail in a second, is an essential tool for finding local food in the Waterloo region. And lastly, I'll talk to you a little bit about what CSAs are. So the map, and um, I did bring several copies of, of them, and they're on the table up front there, and I'll leave some of them in the foyer at 150 Frederick uh, when I leave today, um, was first published as a joint initiative by Public Health and uh, Food Link Waterloo Region in 2002 and it's been operated by Foodlink independently since 2006. It's, in my opinion, the best source of information for uh, local food in this region because in addition to having a map of where the actual farms are located, um, it does indicate retail locations in the three cities where you can find food from these farms. And the listings, the detailed listings on the back, um, a lot of them have uh, information about which farmer's market they have a stall at or um, where they sell food um, in the city that's easy for you to find. And some of the ways that you can do that in the city is look for this Buy Local, Buy Fresh logo. 
um, it assures that the farm is from Waterloo Region. So um, there's some restaurants that have this, uh, certainly farmers market stalls that are part of the, the MAP project um, proudly display this logo. And they also have uh, an online version of their map at foodlink.ca. Um, it's really great. You can go in there and um, type in the food that you're looking for and say how much of a driving radius you're willing to do and it'll pop up all the farms that um, sell corn or tomatoes or whatever it is you're looking for. Um, did we bring those uh, copies of Local Harvest, Mary Beth? Did that happen? No, doesn't look like it. Okay, um, so if you go onto Foodlink's website, um, they, they publish this newsletter several times a year called Local Harvest, and the most recent one uh, focuses on uh, CSAs, which are community-supported agriculture projects. And what CSAs enable you to do is to pay a lump sum fee at the beginning of the year in exchange for a, sh a share of all the produce from that farm throughout the year. So um, some of them will deliver um, boxes right to your home every week and others have central pickup locations throughout the city. I found that um, having a membership in the CSA for my family has given me a whole new appreciation for what kinds of fruits and vegetables uh, grow in Waterloo Region and importantly, if you want to be a real locavore, when. Finding out when things are in season is really important. So not all the food available at farmers markets is necessarily from Waterloo Region and that's uh, an aha for a lot of people so I find it necessary to say that. Most of it is from Ontario but not even all of it. Um, but it is easy to ask vendors when you're at farmers markets where food's uh, from and certainly you can look for uh, logos like the Buy Local Buy Fresh logo or the Foodland Ontario logo to help you determine which ones are local. Another label you might want to look uh, start looking for is the Local Food Plus label. It's the, the second one in the bottom corner of this slide. Um, it has a, certified, a certification process which verifies um, the sustainability of the production processes used in growing food. So that speaks to some of the other issues that some of the critics of the locavore movement um, have, have addressed, the, you know, the, the issues of other inputs, energy inputs into the agriculture process. So they have a, uh, a certification process that isn't quite as strong as organic certification. Um, but does look for a number of environmental sustainability options. Uh, and it has the added uh, feature of um, you can't get its label unless the, the food is sold in the same province that it's grown. So it has that sort of local dimension as well. I won't dwell too much on this uh, splendid business because Rachel from Bailey's Local Foods is going to speak next. Uh, but again, this is something that my family um, uses every week. Uh, it's so easy to use. I go online by Tuesday of each week, select the foods uh, and if, that I want, uh, including meats, cheeses, eggs, uh, in addition to the things you'd expect like fruits and vegetables, tortillas, salsa I get, get from these place, this place. Um, and then I just pick it up uh, at the, uh, the church where, where they deliver it, which happens to be on my walk home from work. So it's very convenient for me, and I think it's a central location for a lot of people. It's just uh, in Uptown Waterloo. And they have a, well, Rachel will tell you. So a big part of uh, learning to eat more local, as you'll sense from reading 100 Mile Diet if you do that, um, is getting in touch with what's in season when. Foodland Ontario publishes a really good comprehensive seasonal availability guide on their website. Um, but the best way, as I said earlier, to fam familiarize yourself with what's in season when is to join a CSA, I would say. Um, because you'll quickly realize you know, when it's lettuce season, when you get four heads of lettuce in your weekly box and then a month later you're not getting any more. So then you'll, you'll figure out and you'll be, begin to plan <laughs> the next year for uh, when to put aside time to put away food for the off season. Several cookbooks are beginning to organize themselves around the seasons too. Uh, my family has found uh, this one, uh, Simply in Season, um, which you can pick up at 10,000 Villages or at most bookstores to be particular help, particularly helpful in figuring out what to do with things like local kohlrabi or leeks, things that you might not be used to eating. And it's organized literally by season. So there's a spring season section, an autumn season section, um, and a really good index to find recipes for those things that arrived in your box that you don't know what to do with. There's very practical skills associated with preserving foods for the winter, whether it's canning, freezing, drying, or pickling. And there's places, lots of resources in this community to um, learn those skills. Um, Public Health has, has uh, resources about, about those things on its website as well. 
So I, I hope you've picked up a bit about the whys and hows of becoming a locavora model region, and perhaps you're going to leave here today a bit more inspired and determined to make more of your diets local. Now I'll turn it over to Rachel. So I'm Rachel from Bailey's Local Foods. Um, and then I, the notes on the bottom, is there a way to, like that? Is there a way to do that where I get to see the notes? No? <laughs> <laughs> All righty. Well, I want to tell you about eating locally in Waterloo Region and how my business could help you. Why buy local food? Um, there is something satisfying, inexplicably satisfying, about being able to name where the food come on my plate comes from. Paul grew the spinach, Brenda grew the tomato, Hans pressed the oil, Perry ground the wheat, and Melissa raised the beef. My kids got a really big kick out of the fact that I put this plate here because that was lunch one day. <laughs> um, so buying local food um, is pretty easy. Most people do eat local food, but adding more local food is much easier and much, much tastier than you think it might be. Um, here's some local raspberries. So you'll notice that my name isn't Bailey. Um, Bailey's Local Foods started in 2008 by Nina Bailey Dick and her dad, Wendell Bailey, who was her right-hand man. Um, Nina sent out an email in May saying, hey, I'm going to drive around. I'm going to get some asparagus. I'm going to get some flour. I'm going to get some cheese. Do you want some? <laughs> so she did this. And 50 neighbors picked up food in Nina's carport once a week. It was pretty cool. Um, the sense of community in the early days of Bailey's was great. People gathered. Kids played. Um, you got to meet your neighbors. You got to chat. Unfortunately, the carport wasn't zoned for a business. So today, uh, Bailey's is a little bit different. There are over 200 households that order weekly. We have two convenient locations. One is the First United Church in Waterloo. And this year, we have a new satellite location in Breslau at the Breslau Local Food Market. They have a community center in one of their new subdivisions. Breslau is a really cool new community, but there are no grocery stores. So we offer weekly pickups mid-June to Thanksgiving. Those are on Fridays. And then twice monthly pickups on Mondays in the late fall and monthly pickups all winter long for root vegetables. Um, the First United Church is used on Fridays for the Out of the Cold program. So that's one of the reasons that we're not there. How Bailey's looks today? Well, it's a bit different. Um, we're in a hall in a church. The really cool thing is that we don't have to deal with the rain or the snow. Um, it's not quite so idyllic as that backyard setting. Um, but uh, we're, I think we're a little bit more accessible to a, a lot more people. This week, it looked a little bit different. There were a lot, a lot of strawberries. Because right now is strawberry season, and you've got another week or two. So hurry up and get those local strawberries, because they're gorgeous. You might say, I don't want to go to all that trouble and buy lots and lots of local food. Well, there are some easy items that you can buy locally. You can buy maple syrup. You can buy honey, meat, cheese, seasonal fruits and veggies, baked goods, flowers, and grains. Those are really easy things to swap out. Um, and you're going to notice they taste better. There are lots of other local options other than Bailey's Local Foods. Mark talked about the Food Link Waterloo region. They've got the map, they've got the website, and they've got a new app for blackberries that you can download. Uh, farmers markets. 
like Mark said, ask where items are grown. Uh, there's a new logo, it's called My Pick, and that verifies that the person selling you the food also picked it. Um, I also want to highlight a new farmer's market in Uptown Waterloo. It's every Thursday evening from 3 to 7. So if you're watching this today, it's tonight. Um, you should go there. They're starting. So there are some CSA pickups there. If you are a member of the CSAs, they've got a cheese maker, they've got a jam person, they've got some bread, they've got baked goods. Um, you really want to watch for this one. Uh, and there are farmers markets almost everywhere. There are lots on the buy local map. When you go to a major grocery store, there are local foods. Ask for more. Thank the produce manager for having those local strawberries right at the front with some shortcake beside it. Um, but realize that if you ask for it, that's when they'll realize that they need to bring more. Um, independent or health food stores in town, the smaller players, again, they're going to do their best to bring in local. Tell them it's important to you. Um, another one that I'm going to lump into there, most bakeries are pretty local. And most bakeries can fairly easily use local wheat for most of their products or some of their products. So do ask for that and make sure that they're not trucking the bread in from somewhere else and just uh, baking it at the last moment. There are lots of farm stores, and this is where I wish I had the back up to my slides, because there are places like Hurley's, like Oak Ridge Acres, like Berry's Asparagus. Um, so many of them. I think I had, I think I had 10. Um, but they're around, and these are people who have taken the family farm from years ago and grown it. They're still farming, and they've put these farms there, and you should go to them. So if it's Wednesday and they, you can't find a farmer's market, drive out there because they're going to be really happy to see you. Uh, participate in a CSA. And Mark spoke about this. They're amazing. Uh, the farmers are great, and I deal with a lot of them, and I bring their foods to Bailey's. There are also local restaurants. Um, and there is Cafe Pyrus in Kitchener, which is pretty walkable from here. Um, Nick and Nat's Uptown 21. I think Marisol's a new player that is trying to do a bit more local food. Um, lots more, and look for them. Ask your restaurant owner that for, to bring more local food in, to cook with more local food, because they can do that. Things within 100 miles of Waterloo. I love this map, because the middle is pretty much where the First United Church is, and it shows that it goes to Sarnia. It covers all of Niagara. It goes to Owen Sound and just to the other side of Toronto. If you notice, there's that little tiny t tip that the, that's the southernmost part of Ontario. That's Leamington, and unfortunately, that's not within our 100-mile circle. But uh, And there are other things like Manitoulin Island, and they're worth eating. Um, the foods from that area. You get to define where you're going to eat. You can eat from your backyard, you can eat 100 miles, you can eat all of Ontario, or Mark's 250 miles from his um, report. All great options. Aren't they pretty? <laughs> um, all local, all root vegetables. So Bailey's Local Foods is here to give you convenience. We've got the convenience of online ordering. That's a look at our order form. We've got convenient pickup locations, the First United Church in Breslau. And if we have more people, we might be able to get more locations. We have no minimum order. If you want one tomato, you can have one tomato. You don't have to buy a case or a bag. Um, so unlike the CSA where you're getting a box and you have to deal with a whole lot of Swiss chard that week, um, or zucchinis, um, you get to choose. Uh, there's no commitment, but I will say we have a $20 membership fee, and that really just covers our startup costs, um, our costs of insurance and rental, and it helps us to pay the farmers more, because that is one of our big goals with Bailey's Local Foods. The benefits to you are fresh local produce. You can meet other people in your community who value local food, and more of your food dollars go to those local farmers. We actually asked, ask our farmers to set their price. So if they need $3 for a pint of organic strawberries, we pay them that. Sometimes you're paying a teeny bit more, but the best part about it is 
that it's not going through another middleman and the farmer gets more money. Um, the fruits and veggies are super fresh. Because you order and the farmers are picking exactly for your order, they're picking it for that day. Sometimes the day before, but in general, you're getting the freshest food you can. Um, and we really, we really like that. Um, this is a display we bring to different places. Um, the Breslau lo local food market is brand new, so we've been talking about that a lot. So if you're anywhere near Breslau, please do uh, come and check in on us. There are lots of local benefits. You're supporting your local farmers and producers. You are encouraging farmers to grow more people food because it's really, really easy to have a crop of soy that's for feed or a crop of corn that's for feed. Um, and growing a plot of tomatoes and a plot of cucumbers and a plot of this takes more time. Um, like I said before, we've let the farmers set their own prices and allow them to live more sustainably and allow us to live more sustainably. Um, by having one person driving for 200 families, we save on fuel and the amount of fossil fuels used to get your food from the farm to you. If all 200 people drove that 40 kilometers to all the different farms in the outskirts, um, we wouldn't be saving much that way. So I just want to let you know that you can eat local. Um, you can do it with joy and um, with a sense of community. Thank you very much. And actually, if there are any questions here, I'd be happy to take them. No questions for either Rachel or Mark? Now would be the time. Yes. Right now, we are on Fridays okay. at the First United location. It is from 3.30 to 7 p.m. Okay. And at Breslau, it's from 5 to 7. Okay. Any other? Yes. Mm -hmm. And the copies of the uh, buy local map are there too, and also up on the table um, at the back there as you're leaving. So thank you both to Mark and to Rachel. I really appreciate you taking the time to come and explain about what it is to be a locavore. We know carnivore, we know herbivore, now we know locavore. And um, what I will do, if you're interested, is uh, send all of you the um, link to the two PowerPoint presentations. And then if you're um, able to get a chance to look at them um, on your own, print them off if you need to, that would be fine. Okay. Thanks so much, everyone.